Ever love something so much to the point where it becomes an actual journey? Passion and nostalgia? Truly a powerful duo. And when video games and one's imagination get thrown into the mix, it essentially becomes a lifestyle. And I'll attest to that. A couple of years ago, I released a video talking about one of my favorite childhood games, Jet X2O, a 2002 water racing game exclusive to the PlayStation 2. That video in particular just went over the character designs and their potential development history. But there was just one problem. The majority of it was just based on theory and speculation. However, given that the only way to identify any Jet X development was unfortunately limited to the game's introduction and development trailers. So, in short, there wasn't really a lot to work with back then. But luckily, that's all changed in recent years, and it brought my journey to a realism mode, and I'm super excited to share it with all of you. My name is Geigen, and while most of you know me from my Left 4 Dead content, Jet X2O was also a very important part of my childhood, and still my favorite game to play to this day. This video here is a little lengthy, but is a passionate documentary explaining the entire development of Jet X2O up until this point. The video will also talk details not only on the history of the game, but the development of each character, my personal opinions of each character, and my journey in figuring it all out. I sincerely hope you all enjoy it. Let's get started. About five years ago from the date of this recording, I started to do file investigation within Jet X2O's ISO file directory. I was able to figure out a lot just through the file identification, but I was more so focused on the characters, so my attention was always tuned in there. Because I know the game a little too well, I was able to mix and match files just based on the names. Process of elimination resulted in me finding the models folder. Jet X2O uses a GOB file format for 3D models. The folder is broken up into levels and teams. Upon looking in the teams folder, you will see additional folders for each country that a writer represents, as well as two generic folders. And they break down even further, with multiple files labeled in a specific way. My favorite character has always been Karen Nielsen, so I will use her as the example. Karen's country is Sweden. Checking her folder shows a series of files. Here's how it works. First two letters is the writer code, or country they represent. In Karen's case, SW is the abbreviation for Sweden. Second two letters are the type of model it is. CH means character or rider as JetX puts it, and CR means watercraft or jet ski. Third two digits is the skin or wetsuit number for the rider or craft. And fourth two characters determine if it's the rider select model, PR, or in-game model, IN. And yes, they are different. The pig rider models have a more detailed skeleton, giving the riders more facial and movement detail. It is also a completely different animation set only activated in the main menu, or as the beta calls it, front end. The in-game counterparts, however, are a less detailed oriented version of what was used in the character select. These models are only operable on the jet ski, meaning their animations, such as tricks, are exclusively tied to that 3D model of the character on the watercraft. So, for example, to pick Karen's default in-game model, you would go to the file swch01in.gob. Pretty easy, right? That goes for every skin. If you know the game well, then you already know that every character has four skins in total. You unlock the rest by doing each character's world tour. So yes, you could easily swap the skins in the game files for every character by changing its name. So if you ever do not want to grind through the world tour, well, here's a shortcut. All of this makes sense, that is until you see the 0-0 labeled skins, therefore making each character have a fifth skin in total. One day I decided to replace Karen's 0-0 PR skin to our 0-1 PR skin, just to have an idea of what it was. As I transition my character over to her, I see the beta skin in my game for the first time ever, and actually flipped out, like... <laughs> So I immediately assumed, like a normal person would, that the corresponding in-game model would work using the same method. I was super excited that I was finally going to play Karen in the costume I always wanted to. I swapped the names, load the game, and then... What the fuck is this piece of shit? You can imagine how bummed out I was. Turns out it was the case for every 00 skin in the final release game files. The character select models worked, but the in-game models didn't because they are not coded in the same way in which the retail in-game wetsuits are. Since we can't exactly put the models in a model viewer, due to them being extremely old and scripted to exclusively operate in some internal program, the only way to tell is by reading the ancient code. 
You can notice terms in there, but it's only about 1% of the entire file. Fortunately for the watercrafts, the Aftershock and Tsunami jet skis were however the opposite, meaning their in-game skins worked, while their craft select counterparts didn't, but to a much lesser degree at that. Unfortunately, replacing the rider's signature watercraft with their 0-0 skins doesn't change anything. You can find those prerequisite jet skis in the generic folders, and replace them the same way you would for any skin. You can even put other jet skis as the rider's signature watercraft if you want to, which could be cool because the AI will also use them, as they are automatically scripted to use their default skin and craft combinations. And this was all the information I had for a while, until one day I saw a JetX20 icon on Google Images. It was the same icon used in the PS2 memory card browser, and I had never seen it anywhere else before. Turns out it was actually an icon representing something far greater. It was a link to the JetX20 prototype. A website known as The Hidden Palace, a community which preserves prototypes of older video games, recently had JetX Row added to their various lists. I saw the screenshots and almost cried because I thought I finally hit the jackpot. I'll finally be able to play the build at which the trailer represented. Well, kind of. After downloading and importing it into my PCSX2 emulator, I started it up and played nonstop for hours. I didn't go to bed until 8am the next morning because I was just stunned by how much stuff I was seeing for the first time ever. I was finally looking at JetX in a completely different stage. It wasn't exactly the same as the trailer shown though. As a matter of fact, in terms of gameplay, there are some differences here as opposed to the trailer, but even more differences than the final build. Let's place this build on a figurative timeline. We know three things for sure. The date of this prototype, dated July 3rd, 2002, and the date of the final release, October 28th, 2002. We also know that the trailer build is located somewhere in the middle here but that date is unconfirmed at this time. Seeing this prototype provides us a framework about the state of the game just a couple of months prior to the final release. We also know that this is the earliest version of the game anyone could possibly acquire at the time of making this video. With that said, let's go over the differences. For starters, you can tell the logo, menu, sound effects, announcer, and camera angles are all different. You can also notice the additional riders and jet skis in the background. I think the announcer is funny because she sounds like Magic conch shell. What do we need to do to get out of the kelp forest? Jet X2O. The shell has spoken! Notice the fourth game mode in the menu, Rescue Mode. This is actually a game mode that was scrapped in early development, where racers would have to drive along a course to save the lost survivor. I imagine this would have been a cool versus game mode, but I guess we'll never know since you can't access it, even when trying to port it into the retail files. In this version of the game, as reflected in the game's introduction, you can only play the characters Taylor Jordan and Luke Lamoche. This is already the first notable difference between this and the trailer's build, as Karen was clearly a playable character then. But that wasn't just it. Like the trailer build, there were only two playable watercrafts, but they didn't encompass the designs in which we're familiar with. The first one is known as the Crusher, which is an early version of Taylor's signature Renegade watercraft. The second one is known as Jammer X, which is an early prototype design of the Tsunami watercraft. Following that, you also only have two levels to play, both of which are presented in JetX's trailer build. They are Neotropic, codenamed Hawaii, and Mesotech, codenamed Jungle. Comparing to the final release, these maps have the exact same layouts minus the signage decals and ramps, but I will highlight the bonus area in Mesotech, which has a special ramp to a location that can't be accessed in the retail build. So already you know your options are unfortunately limited for what can be done in this build. But it's kind of funny considering how the final release demo has even less content than a prototype that is considerably a buggy mess. The retail demo forces you into Slickstream with Taylor on the Aftershock. That's it. That's it? I'm aware it's just a game demo, but it's extremely bare bone, meaning that what it provides isn't enough to showcase what else the game has to offer. Finally, getting into the game, we can then witness the early production in comparison to the final product. Firstly, you can immediately notice the character appearances. Every rider in the game is in their earliest known wetsuit, minus Taylor Jordan. You'll also notice that on the start of either map, you have a ramp centered at the track entrance, but as previously mentioned, both of which are different from the final release counterparts. I believe that the variety of these ramps help express the level design far more. It's truly a shame they're gone and replaced with this boring and repetitive design. 
You may also notice the pathing of the AI, which slightly differs from the retail version. They are much more sporadic and tend to cross paths, creating a little bit more difficult routing for the player. Although it seems like the game director just trying to throw obstacles at you, it's actually quite intriguing to see the AI cross up, as opposed to just riding in a straight line from the start. The only records of this AI behavior and interactions are found in the July and trailer builds. The AI makes it seem as if the game was originally planned to be more difficult for the player on all fronts. In other words, the AI being a hazard that can, by the way, literally knock around your racer, force the player to also be aware of their opponents and not just the course they are racing on, something the final version completely removed. Sadly enough though, this build only has up to 4 racers at a time. The trailer build introduced 6 racers for the first time, while still utilizing this AI interaction. Perhaps the addition of more riders made the crowd control too obnoxious, making them inevitably remove it? I think the change is unnecessary because it adds strategy to the player's pathing and positioning, thereby raising the game's overall skill ceiling. Comparing to the trailer and final release versions, the player's camera and viewpoint is forcefully static at a long distance and sadly cannot be adjusted. As a matter of fact, you can't even access the options menu to adjust it. Looking at the trailer build, your viewpoint is much closer, just as the default settings show in the retail build. The gameplay of this build is still very much Jetix 2.0 at its core, but holds a much more stiff level of flexibility with character tricks. Trying to transition from trick to trick is more difficult to perform as opposed to the final build. The flip side to that, however, is that tricks give you an extremely large amount of points, and are only counted in increments of 5. Speaking of tricks, the whole control scheme for them is different, as in, most tricks are mapped to different button combinations. On top of that, the triangle button is what is originally used to be the trick modifier, as opposed to the square button in the retail version. I personally dislike the triangle button for this function, as it is farther away from the X button, which is what's used to accelerate. Since there are only two playable characters, it's not exactly easy to tell, but both Taylor and Luke only have two exclusive tricks at this time. You may notice that certain tricks used in this build's catalog are what became character-specific tricks in the final version. For example, Karen's Whirlwind, Split Up, and Superstar, and Leah's Super Twist are actually universal tricks that all players can use. I will say, it does look awkward to watch someone like Taylor do the Split Up. I do believe they made the right move when giving everyone their own signature tricks in the final build, as it helps enhance their personalities. Other than that, all else the build has is basically just a unique interface both in-game and on the front end. It's pretty interesting to see, but after the hype died down for it, I decided to do some investigating for the build and compare it to the final version. The majority of the game file format was the same, minus the gob folder. The files were not organized by teams. Instead, everything was compiled together. For example, you can read the text of the notepad files showcasing the character models all next to each other, using the same character code names as we mentioned earlier. However, we can't exactly verify through trial and error what each compiled file is because trying to replace anything within this build's engine results in a crash. Most prototypes are usually extremely fragile foundations of games anyways, so it only makes sense. You can however bring certain files over to the final engine, such as sounds and media, although it doesn't always properly match up. This is all I had for a little while, until one day I'm on eBay and see a Jetix 2 preview disc dated August 29, 2002, selling for $300. I could only imagine that based on the date that this had to be the build I was long after. Finally, I was going to play it. Like that's ever gonna happen. Unfortunately, I couldn't exactly play it once I got it. You see, preview discs don't play on a regular PlayStation 2, so if that doesn't work, you already know that the emulator won't work either. I tried multiple ways of getting this to work, such as editing files in the hex editor program, but had no luck. My only option was to start porting the files over into the final game, and while it wasn't the trailer build, it still showed me plenty of older assets ranging from character costumes to minor map alterations. However, the file padding now utilizes the final release system, meaning that the characters and crafts were arranged separately for the first time. Based on speculation, the maps Slickstream and Hyperion George seem to be the only available maps at the time of this build. At the point of this build, Jetix 2 was transitioning away from the earlier concepts, but given all this build's information, I was able to determine a lot more regarding the history of each rider in the game. We will touch on the character's sequence, backstory, appearances, and conclude with my personal opinions for each. Also, understand that just because these are my personal opinions doesn't mean yours can't defer from mine. Please let me know what your thoughts are in the comments, as I would absolutely love to discuss it. With that out of the way, let's get started. Taylor Jordan, the former BMX biker representing the USA through the Detroit Muscle. According to Jetix 20s story, he was known to be a BMX champion and shocked the world by switching to watercraft racing, 
simply because he was bored and needed a tan. Taylor is commonly looked at as the main character of the game because he's the first character that people get to play. He's also the first character ever introduced to the franchise, as you can see him in every single trailer the game is shown, up until the final release. Taylor is confirmed to have a total of 5 costume phases. The first one is the blue sleeveless shirt, which can be seen in the E3 teaser trailer, the prototype startup trailer, and some additional screenshots. The second phase, which we originally thought of as the first, is Taylor in the green long sleeve BMX shirt, blue shorts, silver boots, and red, white, and blue gloves, but with no helmet this time around. His green shirt has gray and white stripes throughout it, and has a gray centerpiece that says the Detroit muscle on the front, and Jordan with the number one on the backside. This is the appearance he used during the July prototype era. His third phase appearance is the same exact green long sleeve shirt, however with the helmet, that has a slightly different patriotic design. This costume is shown in the trailer build, retail startup introduction, and many additional screenshots. It is also the skin that is used in the August build. Taylor's fourth costume is the blue patriotic long sleeve, or at least I'd like to think it's the fourth. This sweatsuit doesn't have any corresponding date identified with it, so it's presumably interchangeable in his timeline. It's featured in the E3 startup introduction, where Taylor was already using the green long sleeve in game, and in the retail game signage. But the only gameplay I've ever seen it use is the screenshots located on the backside of the Jam Pack 2003 demo disc and some Jet X2O magazine advertising. It seems that the concept was developed fairly early, but as of now, there isn't a way of knowing when it was fully implemented and when it was later removed. Regardless, its in-game design was clearly short-lived. Finally, Taylor's fifth costume is what we have today, being the blue sleeveless muscle shirt with a gray centerpiece along with the Detroit Muscle logo located in the center of the shirt. Look familiar? It seems as if Killer Game wanted to go back to their roots. As for Taylor's Renegade watercraft, it had three known phases. The first version, with the potential name of USA Racing, was used during the E3 preview of the game and shown in some early screenshots. It has an entirely American patriotic color scheme. The base of the jet ski is blue with the red hour going down from the throttle to the bow or front of the craft. On the sides, also known as the starboard and ports, you can see the USA Racing logo within the same font as the wetsuits and signage portray it. Additionally, there are white stars on both the front and the sides of the craft, and white lining to separate the colors. The craft was used in all builds up until the August prototype. The second phase, originally known as the Crusher, based on the July prototype, was the exact same jet ski minus the team name, which became Detroit Muscle. This team name has complementary logos located at the sides and rear of the jet ski. No longer named the Crusher, the Renegade's final design uses the same color scheme and jet ski model, but with a far different looking pattern. The front of the watercrab used a similar looking design as the first one did, but with some shape differences. The sides show a much more sharper looking pattern, with a red spike-like design. Aside from that, other aspects of the craft include the red seat, the Detroit Muscle title located at the top of the throttle area, and the Detroit Muscle logo located near the handrail at the rear of the craft. If I had to rank the best wetsuit, the green long sleeve and the helmet easily will take the title. It just makes so much sense, and in my opinion, honestly fits really well. I believe that the blue long sleeve with the helmet and the final release blue sleeveless muscle shirt wetsuit could have easily been nice alternate skins, at least way more than his other current alternate costumes, especially the beach one, but I guess it makes sense for the tan portion of his lore. As for his watercraft, I prefer the original design over the final design, not that the current one looks bad, because it's sincerely a beautiful looking jet ski, but I believe the original design encompassing a more patriotic theme is just a great looking product overall. Taylor's team name and the stars along both sides of the craft, the symmetry and color tone just make it look so satisfying to use. In short, Taylor is a great character, but they really limited his design potential to be as generic as it could possibly be in the final build. At least he could still wear his helmet. Luc Limoges is the spontaneous, crazy Frenchman representing France with the Funk Mob. Luke has a reputation of being reckless, erratic, and dangerous which obviously goes without saying. <laughs> Therefore, making his competition both jealous of his success and feeling unsafe in close proximity. He is also the only character that didn't change throughout the development, at least for the default outfit, that is. It's a red, white, and blue jumpsuit. On the left side, it's mainly red, while on the right side is mainly blue. The center is entirely white minus the Funk Mob title located at the chest area. Luke's arm sleeves also share the same red and blue colors with the white trim to separate the two. The Funk Mob logo was also written along both arms, where the right arm sleeve actually cuts off as opposed to the left. Luke also has complementing gloves and boots to match the outfit, but are separated by grey lining. You could tell that his alternate costumes went through a couple of interesting ideas, to say the least, throughout the development. 
I do find it kind of cursed seeing him in a sleeveless shirt, since the final release doesn't have any costumes that utilize that concept. Psycho? You haven't seen Psycho? It's unclear how many signature watercrafts Luke Lamoche was given throughout the game's development, but the July prototype places him in the Jammer X watercraft, which is the Tsunami placeholder, while the August and Retail builds have him in the Mastermind watercraft. The Mastermind is not a bad looking jet ski by any means, and I kind of enjoy him using it. The separation of the colors matches outfit, but instead is far more symmetrical than the costume is. The Funk Mob logo can be seen on each side of the dashboard and also at the rear of the craft. I think Luke's costume is very iconic, so I'm glad they kept it throughout all of the game's versions. Killer Game hit the nail on the head with his appearance, so much so that he became the game's cover art. Luke's alternate costumes have little to no competition against it in my opinion. I'd say the same applies to his jet ski, although I personally like to see it use red instead of orange. I believe they gave him the orange color just to help differentiate from Taylor's Renegade watercraft. After all, the Mastermind was developed later in the development cycle. Regardless, they hit a home run with this nut job. Did you see that, did I? Karen Nielsen, representing Sweden with the team known as Blue Crush. Karen was first fully playable in JetX's trailer build and also unlocked at the start of the final game. Screenshots also show how Karen may have been the first female character to hit the development cycle. According to the game's lore, Karen was a former wakeboarding champion who takes pride in being athletic. I mean, I should have guessed that much since she literally says, Hey, it's a rival of the fitness, you know? Unfortunately for Karen, a knee injury forced her out of the sport. I'm a knee! And she ended up taking the JetX 2O challenge in its place. Her previously learned skills in wakeboarding, however, made Karen a force to be reckoned with, as her trick mastery was brought to a whole new level. Karen has three confirmed costume phases throughout her development. Karen, or should I say Anika? What? What? Had her first ever reported wetsuit introduced in the July prototype, and was first seen in the trailer build era. It consisted of a blue, long sleeve crop top shirt with gray and white trims going throughout it, gray spandex shorts with small details of blue and white to match the shirt, dark blue and yellow gloves, probably to reflect her country's colors, and black over the knee boots. You can also find the word Zveria, the Swedish pronunciation for Sweden, located on her wetsuit's chest area, forearm section, and waist side. Karen's second phase wetsuit is what her current third wetsuit is in the final build. Footage can be seen in the game's startup introduction reflecting this appearance in action. It consisted of a blue striped crop top, tan pants, beige shoes, and black and blue gloves. Her third and final design is what we see in the final game, which is just a teal tracksuit with black stripes, black boots, and teal gloves. You can also find the Blue Crush logo located on the jacket and the pants, but there isn't much other than that. There may have been an even earlier phase prior to the first, where Karen may have been wearing a helmet. It's hard to tell in certain screenshots, but I guess we'll never really know. Karen had two phases for her Valkyrie watercraft, the both of which used the same jet ski model. Her first one, which was shown in both of the July and trailer eras of the game, is primarily blue with additional yellow colors on the footwell area, bow, seat, and rear of the craft. There are two bolts located in the front of the craft that travel down the side, giving the yellow line more depth. The Valkyrie's final design, which is the same jet ski model as previously mentioned, uses the same blue teal color tone used on her final release costume. It has both Blue Crush logos on the top of white planes located on the sides, rear, and throttle of the craft. In my opinion, and I may be a little biased since she's my favorite character in the game, but both of Karen's wetsuits and watercraft designs were at the peak during the earlier Jet X builds. Her beta outfit not only portrays her character in a much more extravagant way, but it's also far more expressive and just easily the most badass costume in the game. The lack of Sweden's color yellow on the wetsuit is where her original Valkyrie watercraft makes up for it. I honestly have no idea why Killer Games thought of removing this incredible design was a great idea. While I don't hate her current alternate costumes, because a lot of them still hold some value, I definitely disagree with their priorities here. The current appearance for both of her character and craft are just too bland for my liking. Removing what is easily and should be objectively the best costume in the entire game was not a bold move on Killer Games' part. Why settle for second best? Eva Del Toro, the typical emo and gothic stereotype representing Spain with the team Blackheart. Eva was revealed in the July prototype and first playable in the August prototype and unlocked at the start of the retail game. According to Eva's lore, she is calm, cool, and collected in a race full of hotheads. Get out of my face! Apparently performed less flashy tricks to maintain balance on her watercraft. You're going big! That's right. You're and also likes night races and solitude. Well, I can see the last part. 
You can tell that her character still has a lot to be desired, and doesn't seem to check out. That idea gets proven even further once you're looking for her development. Eva was first revealed as a very different character during the earlier Jedi builds. Eva's first reported wetsuit consists of a gray tank top, red clad pants, black sleeves, a black belt, and gray sleeves and boots. Eva's hair also uses a brighter shade of purple. Also, Eva wears makeup, and I'm not sure what the hell this logo is on the back of her shirt, but it kinda reminds me of... Her second and final appearance is the outfit in which we're all familiar with in the retail version. It consists of a black tank top, zebra striped sleeves, purple gloves, black shorts, zebra striped tube socks, and black boots. Along with her wetsuit's drastic changes comes her watercraft's root textures and adjustments. In the earlier Jedex builds, Eva used the Espana watercraft, which utilized the colors red and yellow as it rightfully should, and white stripes and blue handles. Espana, Spain pronounced in Spanish, is written on the jet ski just like Karen's beta wetsuit with Sweden. However, we don't know if the craft itself was actually named Espana, but what we can confirm is the retail jet ski known as the Dark Storm. This watercraft is the same model, but uses the colors purple and red with some occasional white stripes. Eva also has many unused voice lines, more so than the other characters, some of which were pulled from Karen probably as placeholders, and many others that sound out of place for the most part. Now, back to my point earlier, the original Eva is someone who clearly is still trying to find their identity. I believe the original outfit is an interesting concept to say the least. There's nothing wrong with expressing your heritage while expressing your style at the same time. However, I do believe that the current retail Eva is more iconic and fitting for her personality. Eva's old character is very personalized and looks like a character straight out of Sim and Earth, while Eva's final character is edgy, serious, and tough, like a mixture of... I'm Mandy. And... Her beta outfit could easily fit right as an alternate costume, but I personally prefer the current one as the default option. Yeah, I did just do that. Vladi Zakharov, the hefty military rep racing for Mother Russia with the project. He could be unlocked by completing amateur mode with Taylor Jordan. Like most characters, Vladi was revealed in the July prototype, but was originally named Dimitri. According to his lore, Vladi is a powerhouse who plows over the other players without notice. His aggressive personality is the reason why he can maintain control in a race. He also apparently makes clever insults to intimidate other racers. I'm pretty sure this is intentionally sarcastic because... You are like bug on windshield. All squishy! Fun fact, did you know that Vladi is the only character that references his team name? Victory to the project! Vladi had two known appearances, and two known corresponding signature watercrafts. His first ever recorded appearance has him wearing a red and green tank top, camouflage pants, black and beige combat boots, and red and green gloves. His retail appearance, however, is what is thought to be the same camouflage pants, but with the green long sleeve shirt and gloves that were then made completely green minus the hands palm area. Vladi's first watercraft is completely orange, with some white trims and white lettering. I can't exactly tell what it says, but it may be the same writing used on his early tank top wetsuit, which I assume could be Russian writing, but they're too pixelated to tell at all. There is also no name for this previous watercraft. His retail watercraft counterpart, however, known as Counterforce, is a very military-inspired jet ski. The project logo is very faint, but can be seen near the handles. An additional logo containing the silhouette of a soldier is placed on the front of the craft. This is the same logo that's tattooed to Vladi's chest in his third retail wetsuit. You can also see a few gasoline cans on the back of it with the project's logo fitly located on them as well. Something also unique about this watercraft is the number 1612 located on the front and top of the craft. While it could just be a simple serial number, I did manage to do some research to see if it has any significance pertaining to Vladi's character. If we interpret this number from a numerological standpoint, the number 1612 apparently showcases strong-willed personalities and creative energy, much like his tough appearance and signature tricks respectively. 1612 is also a number that rises above other numbers with its eternal desire for victory and apparently associated with strong leaders, much like his motivation for wanting to win based on his lore and purpose for the game as a whole. There is no proof that this is intentional, but I do find it fitting nonetheless. I personally believe Vladi's earlier wetsuit was far better looking and way more innovative as opposed to the default one in the final build. I understand Jetix isn't necessarily a fashion show and Vladi himself probably couldn't give two shits about what he wears, clearly, 
But such a great concept was gutted for what seems to be no valid reason. Even if the retail wetsuit chain was to complement the counterforce watercraft, he has other alternate costumes that can fulfill that purpose alone. But perhaps what's most shameful about Vladdy's costume change was how his beta wetsuit was changed right before the final release. So much so that it is seen in the game's startup introduction, Vladdy's expert unlockable video, and even the game's manual and press kit imagery. While Vladdy isn't my favorite character, I am very happy that I was able to restore his beta wetsuit. As for the watercraft, not that the original orange craft is bad looking, but I personally find Counterforce easily the more superior jet ski due to its character innovation, valiant effort, and extreme attention to detail. A perfect reflection of his character scene. Vittorio Calabria, Italy's finest water racer with the team known as Vendetta. He can be unlocked by completing Amateur World Tour with Luke Lamoche. Despite the fact that he wants to win, Vito's actual motivation is entirely based on beating Luke. According to the game's lore, Luke's reckless riding caused Vito the entire victory of the previous Jet X2O World Tour. Vito's entire character is easily very egotistical, and when you listen to his voice lines... Hey, you like what you see, huh? Please, please, one at a time, huh? Take a good look at his costumes, you can clearly see how he cares about his image. Perhaps Luke winning last year's tour takes away from Vito's image, causing major jealousy, which I can totally see. This is interesting because not only does it dictate some historical factors of the game's story, but it also showcases the only known rivalry in the entire game. Vito was revealed in the July prototype as a non-playable racer. Like most characters, he only had two costumes. His first wetsuit used in the July trailer and August prototypes was like a racer's jumpsuit, and most similarly to Luke's. The entire wetsuit from top to bottom is green along the core, red along the sides, and a white trim separating the two. You can also find Italia written on his chest and upper back where the white trim would expand that. His arm sleeves also utilize the same design as the rest of the jumpsuit. He also wears boots here too. Also, he seems to have grayish hair in this skin. Maybe he was originally planned to be an older character? Anyways, Vito's final design has him wearing an open red jacket, red pants, black boots, a black belt, and black gloves. This skin also has the Vendetta logo located at the left arm, which is separated by a green star-shaped line, followed by the entire black sleeve to help the logo stand out more. Vito has two known watercrafts. His first watercraft, which is actually first introduced in the Jet X SCEA trailer, which uses a very similar design to his earlier wetsuit. The craft is mainly green with the red seat all separated by white lining, but the craft has a unique red logo located at the back of the jet ski, which I assume to be his earlier logo. Also, Vito's jet ski has a numerical graphic located at the rear of the seat, saying what I believe to be SK4000, although it's too pixelated to tell for short. Aside from that, Italia is written on the sides of the jet ski in the exact same font as it's written on his costume. His second jet ski, known as the Golden Tiger, uses the same color scheme, but with a much more slick, observable, and minimalistic pattern. The modern Vendetta logo can see at the top of both craft's fuel vents. You can also find an additional Vendetta logo located at the rear of the jet ski, similar to Vladdy's additional logo on his counterforce watercraft. Before I give my opinions, understand that I am Italian too, so there may be some bias. I personally love both costumes, but if I had to choose one, I would choose the Beta wetsuit over the retail. Italia being written on the chest, to me, shows pride in his heritage, and I support that. And assuming my theory is true about him originally being older, I also prefer that and avoid thinking of him being 24 years old. Yes, the game says that he is indeed 24 years old. However, I believe the retail outfit easily beats out most, if not all, final release costumes in the entire game. I like the idea of using black on the outfit to contrast with the white on his golden tiger jet ski. The open jacket exposing his chest also complements his egotistical personality. It can easily replace any other costume he has to offer. For the watercrafts, I believe both are really cool, but I would choose the golden tiger over the earlier one. I think the amount of expression on the Golden Tiger hits just right, whereas the older one looks like someone threw up an Italian flag. I also find the name Golden Tiger extremely cool. The name is not actually of Italian origin, but of Chinese culture. However, it has become a symbol in multiple religions, especially Christianity. Golden Tiger symbolized service of righteousness, strength, bravery, royalty, fearlessness, and wrath. While we don't know if Vito is exactly labeled as royalty, we can definitely tell he feels like he should be. Truly an awesome character. <laughs> my, my! You have taste! Lia Cardoso, the plucky Brazilian girl representing with the Sunshine All-Stars. She can be unlocked by beating Amateur Mode with Karen Nielsen. 
According to the game's lore, Leah is the youngest competitor in the entire game. At 15 years old? FBI, open up! Her upbeat personality and childish attitude is what constitutes her title of being the trick princess of the competition, which she also says in the game. Speaking of tricks, I know we haven't necessarily talked about the balance of the game yet, but... Put that at the bottom, where the fuck do you get that shit at? <laughs> you got that uh, m and like oh, shit? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I have a 20 like shit. Ah, uh, that's probably us, though, but I'm not gonna say that. What? Don't even say what I mean! Yeah, Trick Princess is an understatement because she is easily the best character. Leah has three known costume phases. Her first one was introduced in the July prototype and was present until the August prototype. This costume consists of a green long sleeved water shirt with a yellow stripe going down the arms, a white safety vest, white, yellow, and green gloves, a pink skirt, green and pink striped leg warmers, a pair of white shoes. Her second phase costume is actually what her third costume is in the retail game much like Karen with her third wetsuit. It consists of a green and white striped crop top, a yellow and green headband, green and yellow shoes, and the same gloves in which her first beta wetsuit used. Her third and final design has Leah in a yellow crop top with some weird logo on it, pink arm sleeves, blue and yellow gloves, skirt to match the gloves, pink leg warmers, a blue and yellow headband, and boots. What's most interesting about her costume above all others is how we can identify multiple concept art of her costume in the game development trailer. Some of which have not been finalized up until this point. Could other character concept art still exist out there? Who knows? Anyways, for her watercraft, Leah's signature sunburst jet ski had two known designs. Her first one is completely green minus the yellow footwell areas, dashboard, and seating area. It also has a blue and yellow stripe going around the seat, with blue riding located near the sponson area and top deck of the watercraft. There is also green and white riding located at the sides of the watercraft, but like most early jet skis, it is too pixelated to read. Given how the formula for how most JetX riders were developed, chances are this riding has something pertaining to her representing country. This jet ski was used until the retail build, so it made its way until pretty late into the development cycle. Sunburst's final design is under the same model jet ski, but has blue everywhere minus the top deck, footwell, and dashboard. It also has the Sunshine All-Stars logo located at the side of the craft, and pink stars traveling down from the dashboard to the bow of the jet ski. In my personal opinion, I don't like any of her costumes here, but if I had to choose between the three, I'm going to go with the beta wetsuit. I like how it fits with the original Sunburst watercraft far more than the others. The green and yellow striped long sleeve is simple, but effective for the cause. While the pink skirt throws me off, the leggings are what makes the entire outfit come together. Despite how pixelated those pink circles are, I still believe that they are smaller images of her original Sunshine All-Stars logo, which can be seen in the July prototype signage across the levels. What's most significant about this appearance is that it is the only early known wetsuit that doesn't have her country's title displayed on it, which makes it unique amongst the rest of the cast. I find the second phase wetsuit very Brazilian inspired, but it looks too much like a boring cheerleader's outfit. And the fact they had the audacity to color swap this costume and call it an alternate costume still has me annoyed to this day. As for the final appearance, it looks way too dainty for my liking. It makes sense for her upbeat and youthful princess personality, but that's personally where my bias kicks in. I do like how she has a logo on her shirt, but it could have been something far better. What is that thing supposed to be? As for the watercrafts, I easily prefer the first one because it looks so much cooler with that color scheme, whereas the second iteration looks like a set of <laughs> My favorite Leah wetsuit is actually her fourth unlockable one in the retail game which has a purple and blue striped crop top featuring the logo, a complimenting water skirt, shoes, gloves, and headband. The color scheme and its simple but effective design makes this wetsuit so much more visually appealing in my opinion. And don't take that the wrong way because I don't need the... I guess trying to unlock the costume by beating expert difficulty won't be as bad of a grind considering she's got this nonsense to look forward to. Last but not least, Kenji Tanaka. The Japanese character representing Yokohama and the Tanaka Dynasty with the Omega Crew. He can be unlocked by beating Amateur World Tour with Eva Del Toro. Genji Tanaka is the son of a famous Japanese race car legend named Amano Tanaka. 
therefore, Kenji's ability to be a racing prodigy is that much more relevant. Because of this, Kenji developed a hobby in driving, and the passion evolved into a skill set of piloting vehicles for both land and sea. According to the lore, this is however sometimes a disadvantage when approaching rough waters or physically stronger riders. Kenji has five costume phases, although some can only be based on speculation due to pre-existing footage. Also, it's hard to tell chronologically what was presented first, minus the beta and retail costumes. So I will touch base with those first. His first one, which was revealed in the July prototype, has him wearing an orange rolled up long sleeve water shirt with a red safety vest containing the logo with what I assume to be Japanese writing, red gloves, blue shorts, gray shoes, and a pair of white headphones. Kenji also wears a red backpack in this wetsuit. Kenji's final design consists of him wearing a dark blue tracksuit with an orange undershirt, white and purple gloves, a pair of gray headphones, and orange shoes. As mentioned before, wetsuits presented between the beta and final release are just solely based on the imagery and trailers, but with no official gameplay. The press kit and game manual all show Kenji wearing a slimmer looking track jacket, but with shorts instead of pants. Kenji's expert video unlockable and introductory trailer, however, show Kenji wearing his third retail costume, much like Karen and Leah did during the August prototype, which is just an orange shirt, somewhat resembling the first appearance, black sleeves, purple gloves, a pair of white headphones, and orange shoes. I feel that his appearance was very undecided during development because the August prototype has Kenji wearing his retail wetsuit, but trailers following that show him in his current third alternate costume. In short, it's unclear at this time. As for his watercraft, the Mixmaster, much like most other watercrafts, only have two known appearances. His early one is mainly orange with a red bow, trim, handle, and seat. The current one uses the same model but is primarily white, with an orange side rail and dashboard. The footwell, port, and seating areas are all purple, which matches the Omega Crew logo located at the bow of the watercraft. Regardless of how Kenji's chronological development was, I think the first Wetsu was easily the best choice. The entire theme stands out with his original design extremely well. I believe the idea of him mixing red and orange and white is just super fitting for him, whereas the tracksuit idea just seems to be so downscaled. While I personally wouldn't be wearing a tracksuit in a jet ski racing competition, I do admire Kenji for keeping his headphones on no matter what outfit he wears, which is honestly really cool in my opinion. As for his alternate costumes, the orange shirt is cool, but I don't enjoy anything else he has here. Fun fact, did you know that there's a real person named Kenji Tanaka who is currently an executive producer at Sony? He apparently worked at Sony since 1997, five years prior to the game's release. Could be a coincidence, but perhaps it was named after him considering that Jetix is a PlayStation 2 exclusive game. As of now, this is where I am in my journey of finding the lost development mysteries of Jetix 2 and all of its content. As you could tell, I am still very much in love with this game. For being a 20 year old game, anyone could be impressed with Jetix's functionality, philosophy, map design, character innovations, and impressive graphics for 2002. Reviews back in the day gave Jetix 2 an average rating because of these criteria that they met. But has Jetix 2 stood the test of time? Well, for me it has anyways. I wish the universe of Jetix 2 was far more explored, because my gosh, there is so much potential here. Regardless of their development, Jetix 2 has some great character foundations here, and to see them go to waste is almost heartbreaking, because I've come to love them all, especially these two, but mainly her. As for the trailer build of the game, I feel that I'm locked out of something magical. Imagine if this philosophy remained, how innovative the game would have been. But Jetix 2 where it currently stands, still gave me a childhood I'll never regret. It defined my passion for game development, hell, it defined my passion for video games as a whole. The research of 20 year old internet pages, constant trial and error of ancient game files, buying prototype preview discs for hundreds of dollars, and even communicating directly to the developers, ranging from the executive producer all the way to the graphic designers, is nothing that falls short of straight up love, and maybe an unhealthy obsession to some people. Although I am not finished exploring Jetix 2 the journey will not stop until I get my hands on that beta build. One day I'll get it. One day.